Beware of the dogs. Beware of the evil workers. Beware of the false circumcision. For we are the true circumcision who worship in the spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh. If anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. As to the law, a Pharisee. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. As to the righteousness which is in the law, found blameless. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted loss for the sake of Christ. I remember one of the worst job interviews I've ever had. I was applying to be a soccer coach at a school that was in a downtown area in the middle of the United States. I did not read the job description that carefully and did the interview via Skype from the beach in Oceanside, California. Uh, I thought that I was wowing them with my knowledge of soccer formations and lineups and strategy. And I thought, I mean, I had such confidence in this interview. I thought they would be one over in a heartbeat. Um, they were asking me a lot of questions about my connections to the city there, about if I had gone to the school, if I was going to teach at the school, if I was going to live in the downtown area, and uh, a lot of questions like that. I thought they would be impressed by the, uh, the ocean panoramic view they were getting from my laptop. <laughs> One of them asked, the guy leading the interview, and it dawned on me in the middle of the interview, these people didn't know a lot about soccer, really. So I, I thought, even more reason they should be impressed with me. In the middle of the interview, the person leading it interrupted and asked, did you read the job description? That's never a good sign. <laughs> never a good sign. <laughs> hmm. So I'm looking at it. It talks about how they were interested, not in somebody's, you know, soccer knowledge, but they were interested. They weren't trying to hire somebody based on soccer ability. They were trying to hire somebody who had connections to the community, maybe who was an alumni of the school and who had, who had strong connections to the history of the school. Um, suddenly the, the beach shot in the background seemed less appropriate. <laughs> I want to transition from that to this question. When you die and you stand before God for judgment, what is your basis for thinking that you're going to heaven? My guess is that there are many people who haven't read the job description, who have confidence in the wrong things, who think, for example, that they're going to go to heaven because they're religious or because they're a good, a good person, right? Isn't that what everybody says? or because they try to do what the Bible says, or because they, they try to keep the Ten Commandments. Really, what are they? Um, love the, no, wrong list. Okay, not the Ten Commandments. It's really important, so I'm going to heaven when I die because I really try to keep the golden rule. Right, the golden rule. Do unto others as... Oh boy. You would have them do unto you. Yes, got it. Whew. That's why I'm going to heaven when I die. I'm a good person. I always try to do what is right. As if that were the requirement. They show up at the interview thinking that that is what God's looking for. Somebody who always tries to do what is right. They say, oh, I'm going to go to heaven when I die because... God knows my heart. And by the way, people who say that usually mean it as a good thing. Isn't that funny? <laughs> God knows my heart. And they say that like that's positive. <laughs> no, 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 my friend. That's an argument against you going to heaven <laughs> because God knows your heart. Not <laughs> because he knows your heart. Come on. Often in evangelism, I might ask somebody, I might begin a conversation by asking somebody, do you believe in God? And a common answer I'll hear is, is no, I don't. And so I'll talk about that a little bit. And then I might ask, what, what do you think happens when you die? And they say, ah, I'm going to heaven when I die. <laughs> Fascinating stuff, that is. 
Why? Because God knows I'm a good person. So the God that you told me you don't believe in 35 seconds ago knows that you're a good person, so he's gonna let you into heaven. Right. Sweet. I'm following you at least. (laughs) The standard for going to heaven when you die is perfection. It's not an issue as if you're a good person or if you've kept the law or if you, if you keep the 10 commandments or whichever four you can remember this morning or if you follow the golden rule, that's not what it takes to go to heaven. What it takes to go to heaven is that you've never sinned. Imagine showing up to the interview with a list of all the good things that you've done without realizing the baseline here is, have you sinned? Yes, okay, interview over. Much of the New Testament is written about this question. What does it take to go to heaven when you die? It's not that Christians are just fixated on it or something like that. It's that the New Testament is fixated on it. I mean, Jesus came because the way to destruction is wide and there's lots of people on it. The path to eternal life is narrow and there are very few who find it. And so Jesus came to live out that way, to demonstrate the way, to preach the way, to proclaim the way. I mean, these things are written, the apostle John writes in his gospel, so that you might know the son and in knowing the son that you might have eternal life. Much of the New Testament revolves around this appeal for those who don't have eternal life to know Jesus Christ so that they can have eternal life. And for those who think they know Jesus Christ to examine themselves to see if they're even in the faith. Here in Philippians 3, Paul's writing to a church that he started. He knows the church. He loves the church. They're built on the foundation of his preaching And he says there are people coming that are gonna try to steal your faith. They're going to, they're like dogs. They're like ravenous dogs. They're gonna attack you and they're gonna try to rip the gospel away from you. And what is the thrust of their attack? They're going to tell you it's not enough to know Jesus Christ. You have to do something. You've got to be something. You've got to put confidence in yourself. Otherwise, you can't be saved. And that was their argument. And so Paul is appealing to them to know the truth of the gospel. He's appealing to them in light of the fact that as the epistle to Hebrews says, it is appointed for a person who wants to die and then judgment. In light of that fact, what gives you standing before God as it relates to your salvation? What is he looking for? What's on your application? Paul says he refuses to trust the flesh. Look at the last part of verse three. I put no confidence in the flesh. Zero, Paul says. Flesh here just stands for the frailty of this present age. Paul is a a believer. He's been saved by Jesus, obviously. He has a new nature, but he still has this flesh. And what he means by that is that this fallen world is still here. He's a fallen creature in a fallen world. And he does things in his life. He's doing things and he doesn't trust any of them. That's what he means by that. It's a little bit of a a play on the start of the end of verse two that they're the false circumcision. These false leaders are telling other people to be circumcised and and, uh, making cuts to the flesh. And Paul says it doesn't cuts or no cuts. I'm not putting any trust in the flesh. I'm not confident. I don't have confidence in how I live. I don't have confidence in anything related to my life. And this becomes a warning for us. And that's gonna be your outline this morning. Two critical warnings concerning salvation. As you think about salvation, as you think about what it takes to go to heaven when you die, as you think about what you will answer to the question, are you going to heaven when you die? Why? How do you answer that question? Here's two warnings that you need to grasp. Capture these warnings. Think about them, get your mind around them, get your your whole worldview around them, assimilate them into your spiritual DNA. These are two critical warnings. First, he says, don't stand on who you are. Don't trust who you are. Don't take any confidence in your own personal identity. He says, we put no confidence in the flesh, verse four. Although I myself might have confidence, even in the flesh, If anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more. Do you feel like Paul's challenging you to an argument here? (laughs) He is. 
he's trying to provoke his readers here and you're reading it so he's provoking you. He's asking you, do you put confidence in who you are? Do you have confidence about what's gonna happen to you when you die because of your identity, who you are? Do you think that things are gonna go well with you because I'm patriotic, I love my country. I'm religious, I go to church, I'm a good person, I do the commandments, I do the golden rule, I try to do what's right to as many people as I can. So I have confidence in that. Is that what you think? Well, Paul says, great, let's play that game. Later, he's gonna argue against it on the merits of it. Now he's just gonna argue against it. (laughs) You think that you have confidence? You think you're gonna do well when you die because of things that you've done, because of who you are? You have confidence in your flesh? Paul says, okay, I have more things to be confident in. You're gonna trust in your morality? I'm more moral than you are. You're gonna say you're a good person? I'm better than you are. You're gonna say, I trust my patriotism, I'm more patriotic than you are, he says. He'll throw down on every one of these points. He's challenging you to a moralistic arm wrestling match. Show up at the table, say, I'm gonna go to heaven when I die because I'm a good person, I trust in that. And Paul's gonna grab your arm and show you that he's better than you. And he doesn't even trust himself. He's more moral than you are. He doesn't trust his morality. He's more nationalistic than you are. He doesn't trust his national identity. He's better than you are and he doesn't trust being a good person. Don't stand on who you are. Look at his his list. You have confidence? I have far more, he says, verse four. Verse five, circumcised the eighth day. This is the mark of being a true Jew. He starts with this list because that's what the Judaizers were doing. Remember this Judaizing cult that was springing up in the churches. They were Jewish by their identity. They likely weren't born into a fastidious Jewish household. This cult was not big in Jerusalem, but it was scattered throughout the Roman Empire. And many of them might have even been born Gentiles and converted to Judaism later in their life. Some of them were probably born Jews, but just weren't fastidious about it until later in life. Then they hear about Jesus Christ and they believe in Jesus. They, they say, you're a Christian, we're Christians too. But then they wanna add to it. They don't have confidence in their identity as a Christian. They wanna add things to that. And the thing they try to add is circumcision. And they tell people, you're a Christian, I'm a Christian too. Oh, you were a Gentile. So you probably don't know the Old Testament. Let me tell you about the Old Testament. It all points forward to Jesus because it comes through the nation Israel. And believing in Jesus isn't enough. You have to be part of Israel. You've got to be adopted back into Israel. How do you do that? Well, I'm glad you asked. (laughs) You have to be circumcised. The head of the family has to be circumcised. All the men, it's not just enough to know Jesus. You have to be circumcised. And you don't put your confidence in knowing Jesus. You put your confidence in your circumcision. And so Paul takes issue with that point first. He starts right at their strongest point. You trust your circumcision, he says. I was circumcised on the eighth day. That's how God commanded it to happen. Genesis 17, 12. Genesis 21, 4 with Abraham's own child. Repeated in Leviticus 12, verse 3. The priests were supposed to ensure that people were, were circumcised on the eighth day. Some people get confused because many American Jews circumcise on the seventh day when the child's seven days old. That's because Jews and Americans count days differently. You know, when, when our baby is five seconds old, you say the baby's five seconds old, you know. It's not until the next day that he's a day old. For the Jews, they they start with the first day right away. Part of a day is the full day. And so they circumcise on the eighth day when the child is a week old. Paul's saying, I was circumcised the right way. You, Jewish proselytes, you were converted to Judaism later in your life. You got circumcised as an, an adult and you're putting confidence in that, and you're trying to get other people to be circumcised when they're adults, Paul says, I was circumcised on the eighth day. You wanna trust in circumcision, I at least had it done the right way, on the right day. I mean, imagine how frustrating this would be to argue this point with Paul. They're trusting in circumcision, they're trusting in the wrong thing, and Paul's saying, you're trusting in the wrong thing and you did it the wrong way. I, if I wanted to trust it, I know it's the wrong thing, but at least I did it the right way. (laughs) Argue with that. You trust your circumcision, tell other people to do it? Forget about it. Because I did it the right way and I don't trust it. And this would be obnoxious to put your trust in this. (laughs) Somebody converted later on in in life to Judaism to put your trust in this and then to be told it's all for nothing. (laughs) 
man, where were you? (laughs) Don't trust even that. But Paul says, I had it. And I did it the right way. And I don't trust it. Not only was he circumcised on the eighth day, he says in verse five, but of the nation of Israel, meaning that he's a true Jew. All Jews descend from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And if you remember in, in Genesis, Jacob, the, really the final patriarch, wrestled with the angel in the wilderness, wrestled with the angel, and wouldn't let the angel go until the angel would, would bless him. What a fitting metaphor for all of Israel's history too, isn't it? Wrestling with God, refusing to submit to God. It's so fitting that the angel renames Jacob, right? Takes his old name Jacob away and now names him Israel. And from that day forward, everybody who descends from him is part of the nation Israel. Not all who were from Abraham were part of Israel because he had Ishmael. But Israel, everybody who descends from him is the nation Israel. And that's what Paul's saying. My ancestry goes back to Jacob. I can trace a direct line back to Israel wrestling with the angel. You're a convert to Judaism and you are putting confidence in that. Paul says, I have more reason to have confidence in it because I go straight back to Jacob himself. And we know, of course, from Romans chapter nine that not all who were Israel were real Israel. Not everybody descended from the man Israel had faith in the God of Israel. That's his point in Romans nine. And he's making it here in a little bit of a way. I'm descended from the real man Israel, but that didn't mean I had faith in Israel's God. Acts 22 verse 3 describes that Paul was born in a city called Sarsus, a Greek city. But his parents sent him to Jerusalem as a young boy so that he could be raised in the temple around the Pharisees. That should remind you of Samuel in the Old Testament, right? Born as a young child in a distant city and sent to the tabernacle to be raised next to the ark. That's Saul's story. That's Paul's story. You want to boast that you're an Israelite? He's telling these Judaizers, top of this. I'm from Israel, the nation, Israel, the person. Thirdly, he says, from the tribe of Benjamin. He's boasting in his tribal identity. There's 12 tribes in Israel. Benjamin was the smallest tribe. You know why they were the smallest? He was the littlest brother, but also because they refused to deal with sexual immorality in the days of judges. And so the rest of the nation tried to wipe them out and slaughtered most of them. There's only a handful of them left, 600 or so. So they remain the smallest tribe in the nation. Then the first king was from Benjamin. Saul was a Benjamite, who Saul here was named after. The apostle Paul was named after Saul. Remember his pre-conversion name was Saul. So he was, he's a Benjamite named after the first king of Israel who was a Benjamite, letting him know, that, letting you know that he's proud of his tribal identity. But beyond that, there's even a more significant reason he's boasting in this. The 12 tribes after Solomon died, the nation split in two, remember? Most of the tribes rebelled against the Davidic line. They rebelled against David, they rebelled against Solomon, and they rebel against his line, Rehoboam. They don't want him to be their king. They reject him. They get rid of David. They're done with Yahweh. They want to go back to worshiping the golden calves. And so they get Jeroboam, their own king, make their own idols to worship, and 10 of the tribes follow. And they steal the name Israel too. They take the name. Imagine that. <laughs> This is confusing to us when we read the Old Testament. If you're reading through the Bible in a year, you're likely in the book of Kings around now. It's confusing because you see the nation Israel, but that's not the real Israel. They don't have David's king. That's in the south, in Judah. Ten tribes in the north named Israel, but false. Two tribes in the south, the line of Judah, the line of David in the tribe of Judah, And only one other tribe stayed with them. Only one other tribe said better to worship David's king and lose the name Israel. And that was the tribe of Benjamin. They stuck it out. This is described in 1 Kings chapter 12. They stuck it out. And now Paul is boasting and he says, not only am I an Israelite, I'm in the right tribe. You Gentiles that got converted and circumcised later in life, you don't even have a tribe. I have the best tribe, he says. I'll boast in that the first king was from them. We stuck it out. And his name was Saul. That's even better. Thirdly, he says, I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. That's a common Jewish idiom. It's a common Jewish expression. If you want to say something is the best, you say it's the best of the best. And we're familiar with this in the Bible, right? The Lord of Lords, the King of Kings. 
The song of songs, the first line of Song of Solomon is the song of songs. That's a Hebrew way of saying something. We don't, other languages don't usually use that way. It sounds redundant in other languages, right? The car of cars. You wouldn't say that if you had a cool car. I have the car of cars. <laughs> it's funny that Paul is using a Hebrew expression in Greek to boast about being a Hebrew. <laughs> if you're a grammar nerd, you might find that humorous. <laughs> He's writing in Greek to these Greek proselytes to Judaism and he's calling himself a Hebrew of Hebrews. You wanna talk about who's more of a Hebrew? I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews, he's saying. And he even uses a Hebrew idiom to drive the point home. I'm the best of the Hebrews. I'm as Hebrew as Hebrew gets, Paul says. In the book of Acts, you see that the word Hebrew is an expression for somebody who grows up speaking Aramaic, reading Hebrew. These people probably didn't even do that. These Judaizers who were trying to get other people to be circumcised, they likely couldn't even read Hebrew, he's saying. And Paul says, you want to put confidence in your Jewish identity? Circumcised on the right day from Israel, from Benjamin. And I am a real Hebrew. I can read the language and everything he says. I'll boast in it. I'll boast in it. Well, what does that mean? Is it good to be a Hebrew of Hebrews? Is it good to be Israelite by their nation? I mean, there are even people today like the Judaizers who, who think that there's two ways of salvation. Some people say, you know, Jews don't need to believe in Jesus to go to heaven. Have you heard that teaching before? that just their Jewish identity, that's, there's two ways of salvation. You can be Jewish and believe in the God of the Old Testament, the God of Israel, but for everybody else, they need to believe in Jesus Christ. What a heresy, what blasphemy. Jesus is the savior first of the Jews and of second of the Gentiles, but he is the savior of the Jews. It does no good to be Jewish as far as standing before God does. Boast in it if you want, it doesn't mean anything. But does that mean it's pointless to be Jewish? No. There is a benefit of being Jewish and Paul describes this in Romans 9, verse four. I'll put it up on the screen for you. Romans 9, verse four. Paul says, Israelites to whom belong the adoption of sons, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the temple service and the promises. Look at all the things Israel had in the Old Testament. They had the temple. They had the covenants. They had all of the promises. They had the patriarchs. God's glory, it didn't dwell in Egypt. God's glory dwelt in the temple in Jerusalem. The covenants weren't given to the Babylonians. The covenants were given to the Israelites. The temple service didn't happen in Europe, in Rome or in Philippi. It happened in Israel. They had the patriarchs. Genesis starts with the whole world and narrows in on one line, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. That's them. And from whom, what's the point of all of it? From whom, Romans 9, 5, is the Messiah, is the Christ, and notice this phrase, according to the flesh. The Jews brought Jesus into the world according to the flesh. That's pretty cool but it doesn't mean they're going to heaven because it's according to the flesh. The Jews should be able to identify Jesus Christ because Jesus was Jewish. And Paul goes on to say he was overall God blessed forever, amen, period. End of sentence, end of paragraph, end of his point. It's cool to be Jewish because you bring Jesus into the world, but don't trust in that. And you can go back to Philippians 3. Don't trust in that. And Paul, listen, he wasn't just Joe Israelite or Joseph Israelite. <laughs> he wasn't just your average Israelite. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews. He was a Pharisee. Look at the end of verse five. As to the law, a Pharisee. The Pharisees were the strictest sect of Jews. They were fastidious in keeping the law. They were the most noble of all the Pharisees. They were the most zealous of all the Jews. They were the most zealous for the law. They were the most to be esteemed. If any Jew could have confidence in their relationship with God based on their identity, it would be a Jew who was also a Benjamite, who would also be a Pharisee. There's no further rung to climb up that ladder. There's nothing else in that ladder. There's no way up higher than that. This is as high as it goes. And Paul says, I'm there. I'm at the top of that ladder looking down on all you and I don't have confidence in it. Who cares if I'm a Pharisee? What does that get me before God, he says. Acts 26, verse five, he says that his sect of Phariseeism was the strictest of all the sects. Acts 26, five. I mean, this is his life. Is that good? 
Is that something to boast in? No, no. Los Angeles has a large Armenian population. And I met a guy at, I was evangelizing one time named Armin. And I asked him, what's gonna happen to him when he dies? And he says, you don't need to worry about me, Pastor Jesse. Golden. Why is that, Armin? Because, he tells me, you might not know this, but Armenia was the world's first Christian nation. Which is true. You know, Armenia was the first nation in the world, in that sense, to adopt Christianity as their national religion. The first nation in the world to do it. I'm like, sweet, Armin. <laughs> when did that happen? 310? <laughs> He's like, oh, no, before that, like 308. <laughs> Awesome, brother. <laughs> Sweet. Well, why shouldn't I worry about you then? He's like, because not only am I from the first Christian nation, but my name is Armin. I'm named after them. And he wasn't joking. And if you don't know many Armenians, this might open your eyes a little bit. The most common Armenian male name is Armin. <laughs> and he was conveying to me that he literally had confidence about what was going to happen to him when he died because of his ethnic identity and because of his name. I could picture Philippians 3 and Paul's hands reaching out of the pages and grabbing Armin's jacket and shaking him and saying, you want confidence in your national identity? Me too. You want confidence in your name? Me too. But don't look for confidence there. That's not something to boast in. Second warning, don't stand on who you are. Second warning, don't stand on what you've done. Don't take confidence in what you've done. Who you are, that's not gonna get you anywhere. And what you've done, that's not any better either. Verse five describes who Paul was. Things that he was you know, born into for the most part. His own identity. Verse six goes to what he's actually done. As to zeal, he says, a persecutor of the church. Zeal was the chief Jewish virtue. You have know, the chief Christian virtue is love. The chief Jewish virtue was zeal. It was better than love for the Jews because zeal in the Jewish mind was a combination of love and hate mixed together. You love the right things and you hate anything that's against those things. That's zeal. And it was the chief Jewish virtue. Paul says, as to zeal, I had it. I had it in spades. I was a persecutor of the church. The concept of, of zeal being a virtue, it comes back to F uh, Phineas in the wilderness wanderings. Remember the, the Jews in the wilderness wanderings were rebelling against God, committing acts of sexual immorality and idolatry and Moses called an emergency meeting to figure out what to do. And in the meeting, there was a Jew and a, a pagan prostitute in the tent next to them committing sexual immorality. And when they realized what was happening, Phineas grabbed his spear and killed both of them with one stroke of his spear. And then God released judgment on the Jews. And that was an act that was celebrated throughout Old Testament history. It's the chief example of that, Psalm 106, which describes it happening in a, in a worship context. And it says that Phineas showed zeal. And then Psalm 106, verse 31 says, God counted it to Phineas as righteousness. The Pharisees loved that, that story. They loved that passage because Phineas had zeal against the immoral people and God told him he was righteous because of it. So they treasured that. And Paul says, you want to have confidence in zeal? I had more zeal than you. Zeal, he says, I was a persecutor of the church. He's a New Testament Phineas, he's saying. Wherever the church came, I went after them. This is what he says in Galatians 1.23 when he is rebuking the Judaizers in Galatia. He tells them to cease and desist and they marveled at the fact that he was a persecutor of the church. How can one persecutor tell other persecutors to stop persecuting? 1 Timothy 1.13, he says his persecution went beyond arguments but was violent. They sought to kill Christians. Acts 7.58 gives you one example of this. Acts 7, at the end of Acts 7 is where Stephen was stoned to death, the first Christian martyr. And remember, they laid their coats at Saul's feet. That doesn't mean he was a maitre d' in the, the Jewish tradition. The one who had the coats laid at the feet, he was the one standing in judgment over the ones who were executing. 
In other words, he was the one with the Torah. He was the one who was in charge. It happened on his watch. He saw it, he approved of it, he facilitated it. That's Paul's credentials and zeal. You wanna talk about how zealous you are? You wanna talk about how religious you are? Paul is more religious than you are. He would kill for his religion. He did kill for his religion. In fact, when he finally did meet Jesus, he was on the road to Damascus, not because he was holidaying there. He was on his way to kill Christians there too. That's his credentials. As to the righteousness which is in the law, found blameless. And listen, this is the, one, this is the issue that keeps people away from the gospel because righteousness doesn't come through your obedience. And Paul's not contradicting it here. There's a preposition, ek and en, two Greek prepositions. Later he says righteousness can, comes from the law, out of it. You can't acquire righteousness that way, but the, the law shows you your sin and the gospel brings righteousness. But here he's saying righteousness in the law, that contained in the law. The law is God's perfect standard. The law shows you what right and what wrong is and gives you God's perfect standard. It contains what happens if you fall short of it. You should do sacrifices for sin. Paul is saying inside of the law, inside of that system, I had perfect righteousness. Whatever that system offered, I had, Paul says. Whatever the word of God commanded, I did, he's saying. The law told me to do this, I did it. But it doesn't produce righteousness. It doesn't make you righteous. The law can't do that. People think they're righteous on their own because they obey whatever their religion tells them to do. God's pleased with me because I do what he tells me to do. First of all, you don't. But secondly, even if you did, it doesn't matter. That's not what God's looking for. The law, his commands cannot make you righteous. It can't do that. The law is designed to break you, not give you confidence before God. Paul here sounds like the rich young ruler, remember? Good teacher, what must I do to have eternal life? Keep the commandments, Jesus says. He, remember what he says? Done. <laughs> I've done it. Whew, I thought you were gonna tell me something hard. Instead, you just told me to keep everything God ever said. Sweet. <laughs> What's next? This is Saul. You want me to do something, God? It's done. And you still can't boast in your obedience. And you can't boast in your obedience, remember, because the commands of God aren't designed to make you righteous. They're designed to show you your sin. They're designed to break you. It's like a mirror. A mirror is not a comb. You look in the mirror in the morning, it shows you how disheveled you are. You don't take the mirror off the wall and comb your hair with it. <laughs> don't look at the law and think that by keeping it, it will make you righteous. You may as well grab the, the mirror to comb your hair. This morning is daylight saving time. When I was a kid, it was daylight savings time. Where did that S go? <laughs> I, I want answers. Daylight saving time. It's also when the women went away in their women's retreat for the church. How thoughtful that was. <laughs> Letting all the dads get all the kids ready this morning, minus an hour of sleep, no problem. <laughs> While they're at the Ritz Carlton or wherever they are. You guys missed it, but the hallway this morning for the eight o'clock service looked like zombie land. <laughs> All the dads bringing their kids in, shoes hanging off their ears, <laughs> shirts on backwards, eating ice cream. <laughs> and that was just my one-year-old. <laughs> I thought, of, you know, ice cream has milk. It's, it's what Deidre told me to give her. The law shows you how disheveled you look, but it doesn't fix you. It can't fix you. It can't do it. And if you think that when you die, you can stand before God at judgment and be okay because you've obeyed his commands, you think you're good. You think you're obedient when really you've got your shoe hanging off your ear. Your shirt's on backwards. You look like a fool. And you stand before him and you think you have it all together. Your righteousness is like filthy rags. You can obey all you want and it will not make you fit for eternal life. Reminds me of the story of Martin Luther, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, who was fastidious as he was a monk. And then later on in his life, he discovered the, the New Testament and started reading it. 
And that just made him more despondent and more distressed because the more he tried to obey it, the worse he realized he was. He kept going to confession over and over and over again, confessing all his sins to his his priest, the head of uh, the Augustinian monastery in Erfurt, Germany, where he was. And his priest was done with hearing his confessions and said, stop it. You keep confessing things like pride and laziness and knock it off. Come back when you have a real sin to confess. (laughs) Luther says about this time, He writes, quote, if ever a monk were to get to heaven by monkery, (laughs) it would be I. He made up the word in German, it's made up in English too. I should have killed myself with visuals, prayers, recitings, and other work. In other words, the more I did, it didn't do anything. All of that monkery was not a grounds for boasting. This is Luther, Luther is quoting Saul here saying, I did it all, I kept it all. It doesn't mean anything. You can call yourself blameless. It doesn't mean you're going to heaven when you die because keeping God's commands does not make you fit for heaven. It just shows you trust in your own obedience. You're not a good person. Do you think you're a good person? Listen, one of the most insulting things you can tell a Christian I think you're a good person. I mean, how could you say that? Do you not know what's in here? Don't you know what I'm fighting with all the time? Don't tell me I'm a good person. Fortunately, that's not my grounds to stand on before God. I don't have to be good. That's not what God is looking for. What would this list look like today? Pharisee, tribe of Benjamin, circumcised, zeal. What would it look like today? What's gonna happen to you when you die? Oh, I'm going to heaven. Why? I'm a Christian. What makes you a Christian? Well, I was born into a Christian family. I was baptized. I said the sinner's prayer at age five. Baptized again at age six. Rededicated my life to Jesus at age 14. Baptized again at age 15. (laughs) Went on a short-term mission trip at age 16. That totally changed my life again. Act of self-control. I didn't get baptized in Mexico. Went to a Christian college. Found a Christian girl. Married her. Stayed sexually pure till marriage. Have kids. Take them to church. And they're gonna go on a short-term mission trip too. Is that your grounds for confidence, those things? May it never, never be. That is not what it takes to get to heaven. You wanna call yourself religious? I'll find somebody more religious than you who's not going there. You wanna call yourself patriotic? I'll find somebody more patriotic than you who's not going to heaven. You wanna be a good person? I'll find somebody who's better than you who's not going to heaven. Oh no, my friend, don't trust those things. Instead, look at all those things and count them as loss for the sake of knowing Jesus Christ. Instead of standing on them, forget about them. Instead of getting confidence from them, roll them up together, tie an anvil to them and dump it in the ocean. Never look back at them again. Don't take confidence in your morality. Get as far away from putting confidence in that as you can. Get as far away from trusting in your ancestry as you can. Get as far away from trusting in yourself as you can. And look at what Paul says in verse seven. Whatever things were gained to me, no matter how big they were, how small they were, he says it generically, whatever they were, big gain, little gain, small gain, large gain, doesn't matter. Whatever kind of things, whatever kind of gain, I consider them loss, he says. I'm done with them. I'm leaving them behind. I'm walking away from them. I don't know where they are. I'm putting them up and I'm blowing them up with dynamite so I can't even find them anymore. They're done. Whatever shadow of virtue comes from who I used to be, even if the virtue is real, even if it was actually virtuous, he says, I don't want to look at that shadow. Even if that shadow was true, it would just tempt me to be proud. It would tempt me to boast. It would tempt me to deviate my eyes from the gospel. Even if those were good things, trusting in them would get my eyes off of the crucified and resurrected Jesus Christ. Listen, there's only one person who led a good enough life to go to heaven when he died. He led a perfect life. He never sinned. And you know what it got him? It didn't get him God's favor. It got him God's wrath because he took our sins on himself. 
And the father poured out all the wrath that we deserved on him. He was sinless, so he didn't deserve it. And because he didn't deserve it, he could take it. And he suffered and he died making a sacrifice for our sins. You know that the sacrifice was accepted because he rose from the grave, offering life to anybody who would believe that message. Don't trust in your own accomplishments. Trust in the accomplishment of Jesus Christ. I mean, what do you do when you stand before God for judgment and you see the blinding glory of Jesus Christ? You say, but I was a good person. Do you remember what happened to Paul when he saw Jesus the first time? on his way to Damascus, the blinding light, the glorified Jesus Christ appeared to him, knocked him on the ground. He didn't stand up and say, but I'm a Benjamite. I'm a Pharisee, you can't do this to me. No, he was blind for days. He couldn't physically see. And then the Lord opened his eyes and he placed his faith in Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 9, he says, I'm not fit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church with such zeal. Fortunately, God didn't hold his man-made righteousness against him. He forgave him of trusting even in that. What about you? Have you counted your previous life as loss? Have you had your Damascus Road experience? Have you been blinded by the glory of Jesus Christ? Have you said, all I once held dear and built my life upon I turn away from and put all of my confidence in Jesus. I don't want to stand on anything I've done. I want to stand on the foundation of the gospel preached by the apostles. When you do that, you, you echo the song we opened our service with today, I boast no more. And of all the vain things I've done, I refuse to boast in them. They're done away with. You have been listening to Emmanuel with Pastor Jesse Johnson. You can find more resources like this at ibcva.com. Here is a parting word from Pastor Jesse. If you have any questions about what you heard today, or if you want to learn more about what it means to follow Christ, please visit our church website, ibcva.com. If you're not a member of a local church and you live in the Washington, D.C. area, we'd love to have you worship with us here at Emmanuel. We're located in Northern Virginia, and for more information about when and where we worship, check out our church website. I hope to personally meet you this Sunday after our service. But no matter where you live, it's our hope that everyone who uses this resource is involved in their own local church. Now may God bless you this week as you seek Jesus constantly, serve the Lord faithfully, and share the gospel boldly.